I was reading Robert O. Becker's work. He uh, wrote a, call, a book called The Body Electric and published in 85, but he had other papers going back into the 50s. And he, he had a statement in one of his papers that the, the electrical properties of the body control the chemistry. And I read that and it hit me like, a, like somebody shot me. It was like, wow, I have spent a long time learning about the chemistry. I began to realize you can't balance the chemistry if the, if the, if the electrical properties are out of balance. There are certainly chemical things going on, but the speed of electrons move, moving is much faster than anything else and proceeds and controls other physiological processes. Electricity is everywhere in the body. In fact, the nerves propagate information via electricity. And so the wave of the future is electromedicine. And in fact, I look at it in terms of a paradigm shift. Who are you? Why aren't you masked? Who uh, are these Chekhov, people? Russian guy. I don't know. Broke into a the hell is that? American what are military you doing? establishment. Tiring of the metal men in gel artery. What's your degree in? Dentistry. And he got hurt. How do you explain slow impulse, low respiratory rate, and coma? Then they were going to operate on his brain. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. McCoy said, like, they were going to kill him. And Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. He just put an electrical stimulator there and in a minute he was fine. Chemotherapy, fundoscopic examinations. He's coming around, Jim. Uh, talk to me. Name, rank. Chekhov. Pavel. Dealing with medievalism here. The future of medicine is in biophysics, not in biochemistry. The human brain accounts for about 2% of body weight, but consumes 20% of the body's energy. It contains 100 billion neurons and 400 miles of blood vessels. The human brain is also thought to process around 60,000 thoughts each day. This is possible because his nervous system is the most complex. In this experiment, we see and hear a cat's brain hearing a watch tick. Even with no stimuli, the brain has a spontaneous rhythmic beat. The resting human brain exhibits an even faster beat. The neuron or nerve cell, a tiny structure designed to receive and send communication signals which are also called impulses. The movement of nerve impulses through individual nerve cells involves both chemical and electrical changes. A specific nerve cell is activated when one of its antennas or receptors becomes excited. The thing that excites the receptor is called a ligand. Traditionally, ligands have been assumed to work mechanically. So a ligand was initially thought to be like a key. So if you look at your car door in the old days, you had a key and it had to be inserted into that lock to change it. So the lock was the receptor, the key was the ligand. So over time we've found out that it doesn't have to be directly inserted as we originally thought. A ligand actually is a frequency, a wavelength. So now we can correlate it to the fact that you do have locks on your cars, but you don't put a key in it anymore. You have your fob, and it's a wave signal that is, that is set up that matches your car. So you can find your lost car in a parking lot by pushing your little zapper and your lights come on. You can start your engine from inside your house.
by pushing the little button. You don't have to be in its presence. And that's the same thing that we know is happening with wavelengths and with microcurrent. And so when you start understanding that the cell membrane receptors not only can be chemical receptors, but also electromagnetic antennas that are hooked in uh, through the cell membrane, and activation of, of, this, uh, of this antenna can be done either by a, a chemical or by a specific frequency, a resonant frequency. So we have hardwired communication inside the body with electrical flows. We have wireless communication. We have photonic communication. Uh, so there's a lot of communication systems going on, but these involve the, uh, the physics of the, of the body, the electrical properties. As a neurologist, I work a lot with brain-related conditions that directly are Im impacted by electrical changes in the brain, for example, seizures and epilepsy. And in fact, a lot of uh, interventions and even something like electroencephalogram or electrocardiogram all measure electricity. In the case of electroencephalogram or EEG, we can detect surface or cortical activity just by looking at what's going on electrically in the brain. So it's really inescapable that the electrical changes in the body and the brain are playing a huge role and are used diagnostically, but also now can be used as far as intervention and therapies therapeutically to help people to get well. This understanding of the brain electric may seem like science fiction. However, medical treatments operating at this level of bioelectricity have been available for more than three decades. In a previous film, we featured the AlphaStim device. AlphaStim is a form of cranial electrotherapy stimulation, or CES. CES involves the delivery of electrical stimulation through the skull by the attachment of electrodes. Since the brain is mostly electrical in nature, it can readily be modulated by electrical intervention. We use electricity and a very small amount of electricity, microcurrent, uh, which is millionths of an amp. And we use that in the brain to treat anxiety, insomnia, and depression. And we can also use the same current and same waveform on the body to treat pain peripherally. Back in 2017, more than 100 studies had already been completed on AlphaStim. And since then, there has been a growing level of interest in research from some of the most prestigious mainstream research institutions in the USA and UK, such as MD Anderson and the NHS. Currently speaking today, we have probably 30 studies underway. Um, those are in all different phases, from things as literally as designing a protocol and writing that up to uh, one or two that should be published within the next couple months. My name is Sriram Yeno. I'm here in MD Anderson Cancer Center in the Department of Palliative Care Rehab and Integrative Medicine. I'm one of the research faculty uh, working as an associate professor. This has been a great passion of mine to develop effective strategies to manage symptom distress in advanced cancer patients. Pharmacological treatments was sometimes challenging because of the multiple medications the patient is on and also the drug interactions for cancer pain. A lot of the time, 90% of the time, we give uh, opioids and opioid seems to be beneficial, but they do have a lot of side effects like nausea, constipation, drowsiness, but also problems with addiction. The worrying rise of opioid painkillers. The number of opioids like codeine, tramadol and morphine prescribed in the UK has risen fourfold since the 90s, and we consume more than any other country in Europe. The UK is still some way behind America where doctors talk of an opioid crisis that's claiming tens of thousands of lives each year. Uh, as clinicians or physicians, we are tending to give medications. Electromedicine is the next option that one has to look into. AlphaStim uh, was a, a great answer for a collaboration. We reviewed the literature and there was uh, this uh, intervention that was FDA approved. And for the target symptoms we are planning upon, that is managing patient symptoms, specifically pain, insomnia, anxiety, depression. And we found that this was a good fit because we felt that the, our patients may be able to use this on a regular basis. And what they used was um, our cranial electrotherapy stimulation, so CES, to treat the brain. 
And what they were doing was the primary measurement was looking at pain reduction in what they called advanced cancer patients. Um, so these patients in a lot of pain, they use CES to treat their pain, but they also, because we work with mental health and we treat anxiety and depression, they measured other measurements as well. So they looked at depression, anxiety, insomnia, functionality for these patients, and then their sedative medication use. Uh, we're happy to say that there was significance in every category. Um, so we're very proud of that, and especially with pain, which was the primary measurement. I have a very strong interest in cancer. My mother died of cancer over a four year period and uh, in 1988, and her symptoms were not well controlled. She suffered more than she needed to. And uh, I was a lot younger back then in the 1980s, of course, and I, I didn't really know what I know now, and I try to help her, but maybe what I know now, I'm board certified in pain management. I, I, I could have, she should have had better care. And uh, so it was very satisfying for me to see the top cancer institute in the world, MD Anderson, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, using AlphaStim for symptom relief in all four of the FDA cleared indications, anxiety, depression, insomnia, and pain management, and getting really good results in advanced cancer patients. We're very excited about our work that was done at MD Anderson. They are a top rate uh, facility in this country, and it was a privilege and an honor for them to take our technology and to study it, and then to, of course, get the good results that we always expect to see uh, fall out of that institution. We're very proud of that work. and. They did it on their own, so without us, without any funding on our part, so we we're uh, very happy with that. And All the patients said that they had a full satisfaction and they had no difficulty and it was easy to use. And uh, the other important result was about the effect sizes and preliminary efficacy. And we used some of the validated tools in uh, advanced cancer patients for pain, like we used the brief pain inventory and there was significant improvement. We looked at the anxiety and depression using the hospital anxiety depression scale and there was significant benefit. And for the insomnia, we used the Pittsburgh sleep questionnaire and uh, it was beneficial. So when we used this uh, instrument for about a month, there was a benefit and uh, it was safe to use. The, the fact that, you know, it is FDA approved, the fact that it was found to be safe didn't surprise me. Uh, the effects in terms of improvement of symptoms uh, did surprise me because we were anticipating some benefit but not the benefit we saw. And uh, believe me, you know, it requires a very simple way to hook up and uh, very portable and the patients can, uh, they hardly feel any sensation or uh, discomfort and um, it is something that they can uh, you know, go with uh, as they are getting the regular day-to-day -day care. So I think uh, this would uh, be something very interesting to move forward with. Now, a handheld gadget which delivers mild electric currents to relax people with anxiety is being trialled for use on the NHS. The Alpha Stim device, which is the size of a mobile phone, sends currents via the earlobes to increase alpha waves in the brain, which creates a more relaxed state. 161 patients clip the device to their ears for 60 minutes a day, some for six weeks, some for 12. The uh, NHS, as you know, has some financial problems, so they were looking for solutions. I think governments are much more interested in the cost of healthcare than actual healthcare. You know, in the United States, they always talk about the cost, but nobody's talking about making it more efficient. So I'm going to talk about uh, an implementation study of, of, a, of a, uh, a neuromodulation intervention. So Professor Morris, he found AlphaStim, 
And he looked at the literature and decided this is effective just by reading the literature. There's over a hundred studies, one should be able to do that. And NICE had told them that we need to, you need to provide evidence of trials and studies in an NHS setting, not just in volunteers in other countries. And you need to provide health economics evidence. So they determined that it would save quite a bit of money because right now, the first line of defense is uh, talk therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's expensive. Um, that's, uh, you're getting into thousands of pounds. And when that fails, uh, and it often does, at least 40% of the time, then they, then they get drugs, which is even more expensive uh, on a monthly basis. Um, and in fact, half of those patients did not need to see a specialist afterwards. The big implication, the big uh, look at the study was actually to see the health economic outcome. So what impact would that have on their program, on the economics? And they found that they saved uh, approximately 720 US dollars per patient. And importantly, and this is the most important thing, only 28% of people required step three psychological treatment. So both of the services have now bought this product because it just makes it just allows them to provide a sustainable service. And I think that's probably the most important thing about the whole study. Thank you. And that frees up the professionals to get to the, the uh, cases that really need their, their focus and attention uh, more quickly than they're getting it now. There are a number of movies that really do an excellent job of depicting PTSD without even mentioning that it's PTSD. And one of them um, came out in 1946. It was the Academy Award winning film, The Best Years of Our Lives. And we didn't even know about PTSD until after the Vietnam War. Fred. Yeah? Are you really all right? Oh, of course, I'm all right. Why? I mean, in your mind. Is My like mind? That? You mean you think I've gone goofy? What was Godowski? Where did you hear about him? You talk in your sleep, honey. Sometimes you shout, something's on fire, and you want somebody to get out. You keep saying Godowski, Godowski. Godowski. Oh, he was a friend of mine, a B-17 pilot. He got it over Berlin. Can't you get those things out of your system? Oh, sure. Maybe that's what's holding you back. You know, the war's over. You won't get any place till you stop thinking about it. Come on, step out of it. Okay, honey, I'll do that. It does a, a really outstanding job of demonstrating the difficulties in adjusting to society and a society that doesn't understand because they haven't been exposed to that kind of war trauma. My name is Dr. Kathy Platoni, clinical psychologist retired Colonel, U.S. Army, and Colonel, Brigade Psychologist, Ohio Military Reserve, State Defense Forces. My um, chance to have deployed with the Army four times are definitely the major highlights of my life in serving my country in, in time of war and in the wartime theater of operations. That that's certainly um, stands out more than almost anything except being the Dayton SWAT psychologist. So. Um, I train with Dayton SWAT and I accompany them on all the call outs and provide support whenever and wherever needed. So I le lead a very adrenaline rich life. Let me begin by saying that I'm intimately familiar with PTSD um, as um, a survivor of the Fort Hood massacre. I also have PTSD and am very open about seeking treatment for that. Um, 
there's a difference between post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we also refer to post-traumatic stress as critical incident stress. Um, an incident is considered critical if it overwhelms all the senses, is of a catastrophic nature, and is severely stressful to the degree that even people who are accustomed to dealing with severe stress, for instance, combat veterans or service members or first responders, um, if it overwhelms them in such a way that they have difficulty coping and returning to duty, it's considered critical incident stress or post-traumatic stress. If that continues unabated for four weeks or more, we typically diagnose PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. But that's a misnomer. It's more of a psychological injury than a disorder because it changes the way the brain processes information. Everything goes to the brain's alarm system or the, the fight or flight response comes of that. And it looks like this. Everything begins to feel very threatening. The whole world becomes a threatening and sometimes frightening place. There's flashbacks where the sufferer relives the actual traumatic event in real time as if they're going through it again. Intrusive and disturbing memories, severe sleep disturbances, falling asleep, nighttime awakenings, staying up all night without getting any sleep whatsoever. Hypervigilance, where you feel that danger is everywhere. An exaggerated hyperstartle response. Anhedonia, or the loss of interest in previously enjoyed activities. Memory impairments, in many cases it's not unusual at all to have difficulty remembering certain aspects of traumatic events. So there's a host of symptoms that are very descriptive of what most people who are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress injury live with on a daily basis. I was very fortunate to be um, trained in the use of cranial electrotherapy stimulation and microcurrent electrotherapy treatment in 1990. Um, I worked at the pain unit of Miami Valley Hospital and treating chronic pain was the mission of this program. And one of the more powerful interventions that we used were the alpha stim devices. So that was my first exposure and I have been using it in my own practice ever since with tremendous success. Um, I used it in Iraq and Afghanistan very widely. And soldiers and Marines would line up at the doors of our clinic, such as it was, a clapboard clinic with a few boards nailed together or an old compound from the Iraqi army. But they would line up day after day, night after night. And in one instance, we only had one alpha stim device. So those were long nights, but everybody got their treatment. And the the results were unimaginably positive across the board without exception. I think the main thing that got the military to start using alpha stim is that they were looking for solutions that didn't involve drugging the soldiers. Because, for example, if you give them a sleeping pill, they are out of business for 12 hours. Uh, they, they, they cannot work uh, on a sleeping pill. I mean, the, the side effects are horrendous, uh, including uh, sleep uh, walking and uh, sleep uh, binge eating and sleep driving and just some, some, some bad things. And we certainly cannot affect a soldier's mind like that and, and, and put them in the very dangerous job that they have. There are no side effects. Every medication has side effects. Even aspirin has side effects. Some of them can be quite nasty. Many of the medications prescribed for the treatment of PTSD, depression, anxiety disorders, and sleep disorders are very addictive. There are no side effects to the alpha stim unit. And if there are, they are very um, easy to weed out and very self-limited. Um, sometimes some vertigo or lightheadedness and dizziness, which means you need to turn down the setting on the device so that the microcurrent, which is a millionth of an ampere, is reduced. 
you don't see that with medications. So with my experience, there really are no side effects to the device if it is used properly. The soldiers liked it. Uh, you can actually feel the anxiety melt away in the first treatment. And so eventually they really, um, they really embraced it. The, it. the powerful effect and the lift to the brain that this device gives continues to amaze me after 30 years of use. I've never seen anything like it. And I certainly haven't seen the types of results I see with medication therapy or pharmacotherapy as I do with the AlphaStim devices. It is portable. You can use it at home. You can use it at, at work if the setting and your supervisor are on board and in support of that. Um, and it can't hurt you unless you're pregnant and maybe not even then or you have a cardiac pacemaker. Those are the contraindications. Otherwise, it will be of benefit in almost every case in my experience. It really depends on the individual, but uh, I have found that um, anxiety and PTSD are the conditions that respond more rapidly than depression and insomnia. Um, treatment for those two um, conditions seems to be almost instantaneous in many cases because of the internal quiet um, that it elicits. My name is Anthony Paletta. I was a Joint Terminal Attack Controller for seven years in the United States Air Force uh, before I was medically retired in 2013. I was basically responsible for all fires on the battlefield. So anything from artillery, close air support, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, attack helicopters, those sorts of things. The JTAC's responsible for calling in airstrikes and keeping um, tabs on the friendly ground scheme and maneuver. So I had multiple tours both to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, in particular, southern Iraq and um, eastern side of Afghanistan. I'm currently in the community care program through the Department of Veterans Affairs and they paired me with a Dr. Kathy Platoni. Kathy Platoni um, introduced me to Alpha STEM. I did my own independent research on it. Um, and then we went through the VA and coordinated through the VA on getting an actual device. A large component to my PTSD symptoms is anxiety, and in particular, social anxiety. Um, Alpha STEM pretty much relieves all of those symptoms within a matter of minutes after it turned the device on. Um, and that's, that's, that's the primary area that it's helped me out the most. Um, it's helped out with a little bit of depression because the anxiety and the depression kind of coincide with one another. Um, but it's a godsend for anxiety. I would say um, from the point of my last deployment, I've been on a, over 10 different psychiatric drugs. Um, a lot of them caused additional problems, additional side effects, unwanted side effects. Uh, with Alpha Stem, I'm down to two and they are as needed. So no more daily medications. Whenever you know, we, we came about with the Alpha Stem and, and yes, we need this device, you know, we had to almost threaten a congressional in order to get this ordered. Um, the crazy part to me is that this device already was in the VA formulary. Um, and so, it is and has yeah. been for many, many years. Yes. And it was only when we threatened to get tough approach that the, the order was put in. It should never have taken that. No. It should never have had to go that far. It should not have. It seems like a lot of these parking lot suicides we're starting to see more frequently um, here in 2019. Uh, yeah, there's been numerous it, of them. It seems every week there's a new one in some part of the country, and it's becoming a big problem, an epidemic. It is, it is epidemic. People are desperate. Yes. And when they can't get what they need and they're dealing only with a, a hefty bag filled with medications, all of which have side effects in combination or as, as standalone medications, this is what this is what we're seeing. That, Absolutely. And it, it doesn't matter what the age range is, it's happening across the board from twenties to late fifties. Yes. All ranks involved. This is such a powerful statement about the care that's not being provided by the VA. 
that's there's a message when you're taking your life in the parking lot what does that say absolutely <laughs> it's the ultimate form of protest that it, these guys are doing absolutely the ultimate form and you know i mean we've we've gotten all too comfortable with the you know the cocktails of prescriptions and a lot of the more all natural or holistic routes are either being discredited or omitted. Completely omitted. Yes. And one of the things that um, the VA never warns their patients about is that there are black box warnings on all antidepressants and some other medications and other classes as well for ages 18 through 25. And those black box warnings involve suicidal ideation and gestures and yet they're handing them out like candy. And the reason for the prescription in the first place was potentially suicidal ideations and tendencies. Right. So to exacerbate that, in this case, post-traumatic stress disorder symptom is counterproductive. And they don't get it. I mean, these are licensed physicians who don't even realize the damage they're doing and the risks they're placing our veterans at. Right. Every day. Right. medicine or holistic medicine is generally not provided for in many medical settings. I think there, there needs to be a tremendous focus on training integrative medicine and alternative medicine, whether that be hypnotherapy for pain management, the alpha stim products like the alpha stim M, the alpha stim aid, which has no side effects. Uh, uh, um, acupuncture, yoga, there are so many different forms of alternative medicine that are out there, but exposure to these types of therapies is, is so limited. Today we pay tribute to an American who placed himself in the thick of the fight, again and again and again. In so doing, he has earned our nation's highest military decoration, the Medal of Honor, who will, and we are extraordinarily proud of Sergeant Dakota Meyer. My name is Dakota Meyer. I, uh, I was a Marine from 2006-2010. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I first heard about Alpha Stem uh, in October of 2016. My anxiety got real bad. I tried to call the VA for help. Um, the VA does their typical VA thing of, you know, well, it'll take us. You don't, you know, you didn't, you're not established yet with a primary care doctor or a um, a case manager. We need you. You know, you'd have to get that. So it's like this whole process is going to take over a month for me to get there, and I'm like melting down over anxiety. And finally, someone, uh, they actually, the Semper Fi Fund, sent me an alpha stem to help with my anxiety, and it just helped melt it away. I mean, when I looked at it, I gotta be honest, I thought it was some type of snake oil. You know what I mean? I thought it was some type of just, this is never gonna work. Like, really, I was actually pissed off when I seen it, when I thought people were, that, that this is like really the seriousness you have, you think my anxiety is gonna be taken away by this. Finally, a couple weeks later, I put this thing on and it just, I mean, for my anxiety, which turns around and everything in my life is stemmed from anxiety. My depression stemmed from anxiety because I get depressed over not being able to control my anxiety and then, you know, it's just this vicious cycle, but it's all stemmed from the root of anxiety. And um, the alpha stem has, has helped me, you know, it's helped me stay off of drinking. It's helped me you know, live a normal life. It's helped keep my anxiety down and, and, and help me get my, you know, help me get back to what's normal. 
you know, so Alpha Stem helps me in, in every aspect of life. I mean, the anxiety is what drives me. It keeps me where I can't focus. So, you know, with Alpha Stem, it helps me get a good night's rest. It gives me the ability to not have to take pills and not have to take medications that would alter my way of thinking when I'm running a company or when I'm giving a speech in front of a crowd, um, traveling or being a father. So it's, it's helped all aspects of my life by being able to have this device that I can put on and it doesn't change any aspect of my day while using it or even if I need to use it during that. You know, so I have taken medications and, you know, it's, it's so much better. The Alpha Stim is so much better because like, it doesn't have that hangover effect, you know. If I take a Klodipin or a Xanax, I mean, the last thing I need to do when I have my kids, I mean, I'm a single father. The last thing I need to do is take a Xanax and then have my kids by myself. You know, what if they get hurt or, I mean, anything like that, right? Even to go to night go, or go to sleep at night, if I take sleep medication, how am I going to wake up for my kids when they need me in the middle of the night? You know, having a, a, a three-year-old and a two-year-old, I mean, I can't, I can't single father them, you know, 50% of the time and be able to do that while taking medications that just make me a zombie, make me not there. So the Alpha Stem has been able to, you know, it's helped me in all aspects of it's way better for, for my life and way better for me to not have these hangover effects and all these alternate effects from, to have all these side effects from medication. The longer you use Alpha Stem, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy because the less you really need it. I mean, I don't use it every day now unless I need, you know, like a, I call it a maintenance cycle, but I mean, I don't use it every day unless I need it. And it, it gets it under control to a place to where like the, the more you use it, it's almost like the less you need it. But I, you know, I mean, I still, I use it whenever I'm feeling anxious. I was just fortunate enough to have the Semper Fi Fund going out and, and like they have been doing for a long time, making up for the shortcomings of the VA system that was set in place to do this very thing of taking care of veterans. You know, and I, I think that the more that we start talking about this in the Alpha Stem and people seeing it and them seeing the effects of it, I mean, the military is all about it. It's just about fixing the problem of getting it to them, making this readily available to the people who need this the most. My name is Dr. jean Renel Corbier. I am a board certified neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology. I am the medical director of the Brain Restoration Clinic. Uh, I'm also the chairman of a nonprofit 501c3 called Brain Restoration Ministries, which is devoted to brain health and neuromodulation treatment for those that need it. Uh, I have a primary focus or have had a primary focus on neurodevelopmental conditions such as autistic spectrum disorder and uh, speech delay processing conditions. However, I do work with all neurological disorders. I also work with my twin brother. He's an internist. Uh, so with him coming in my practice a year ago, we have expanded to take care of a lot, of, a lot more adults as well as the pediatric uh, population. So, but the focus is brain related in both cases. Autism is on the rise. I remember when I first got into the field of autism, this was early 2000, 2001, 2002, I had been looking at prior statistics that, was saying, that were saying that there was a one in 10,000 incidents, but then it then quickly jumped over the years to one in 150, and then one in 68, then one in 59. There's been a big exponential rise in autism, which has always fascinated us because anyone that looks at autism has to ask why is there this sharp rise? I was told when I asked some of my colleagues what they thought about it, uh, including some that have worked in the field of autism, they'll say, well, it's due to better recognition of the disorder. People are talking about it more, we're recognizing it more, but I thought, well, no, that cannot explain that sharp rise. Uh, also, there was a big emphasis on autism being a genetic disorder, and genetics by itself would not cause a rapid rise, not that quickly in, in the rise of autism. So there must be other factors. Um, my thought is that the increased rise in autism is due to environmental triggers as well. I'm not saying that genetics don't play a role. In fact, we check patients out for genetic disorders, but there are toxins in the environment, pollutants, PCBs, uh, pesticides, a variety of exposures that I think are also on the rise that, uh, that I think are playing a role in, in the development of, in the sharp rise of, of autism that we see. 
children and adults that have autism have a variety of symptoms uh, that result from dysregulation of neural pathways in the brain. Many children with autism have sensory processing disorders, which means that they will be sensitive to sounds, sometimes light, even to touch, what we call tactile defensiveness. Most of the individuals with autism we see have some degree of anxiety, sometimes very severe, uh, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, hypertent or I should say ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, sleep problems. All of these conditions are ones that respond very well to a technology uh, like alpha-stim because alpha-stim can regulate neurotransmitters through a patent uh, technology allow a small wave of current to uh, enter the brain through the brain stem and cause a regulation, if you will, of chemicals and, and electrical patterns in the brain. And so for a child with autism, that may mean for the first time the brain calms down, uh, relaxes, uh, the anxiety gets better. And when all of these occur, that also means at the same time that the frontal lobe uh, right here is able to open up for cognitive activity. When the brain is under attack by sensory processing, anxiety, it's very hard to engage in higher cognitive thought, even speech and language. So with autism, alpha-stim can help with a variety of conditions that are caused by the, uh, by the underlying changes that we see with, with autism. But we've also used it for other things, for example, pain, in particular headaches. Uh, we've had some patients who have come in for a visit or a group lecture and who are complaining of pain where we're able to use the alpha stim right then and there and would get good relief. Uh, anxiety is a big one, uh, insomnia, mood disorders. We've also used it for cognitive challenges. We, we've seen some people respond quite well uh, cognitively. So we have used the alpha stim for a variety of conditions, neurological conditions, both in kids as well as adults. Some patients respond and clients respond very quickly. For instance, I can share with you, I had a mother who was in this very room. We were doing a consultation for her son with autism and we were discussing some very sensitive topics and uh, she started to tear up a little bit, but we could also see that she was stressed. In fact, that was one of the things that she shared with us, as a lot of parents do, is that you know they're very stressed out. So I had a uh, nutritionist working with me who uh, also uses the alpha stim and she, was, she helps me with patients. And so I asked her, or we decided to put the alpha stim right then and there while we were doing the consultation, while we were talking to mom about her kid. And we, we explained to her what it is and what it can help with. And after a short period of time, she actually started to cry or she, she was very sad. And uh, I was, at that time, I was a little shocked. I said, is everything okay? What's going on? She says, I never knew I could feel so good or that my stress could be lifted up. So I was a little surprised because it occurred very quickly after putting the alpha stim uh, after uh, several minutes, but not very long at all. Uh, I've had other situations where someone is having a really bad headache. We had a patient who had been to the ER then came to see me but was still suffering from a bad headache and after say 20 some minutes or so of the alpha stim did well. Other individuals it may take longer. They, they may require days, some may require weeks, but generally speaking we start to see some good results rather quickly in terms of the peak or how much result it, it varies. Some people take a little longer to get the full effect. We do look at a variety of other factors too to make sure we're getting the, the best results and the quickest results possible. Yes. One of the reasons we like using technologies like alpha stim is because number one, safety. And safety is a very big part of our practice and approach and we found that compared to medication alpha stim is very safe. It's not that medications don't work, but sometimes they cause unwanted side effects, which what we have seen is that these side effects could be even worse than sometimes in the problem that's treated. And so with alpha stim, for example, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, alpha stim is a more direct, gentle uh, intervention that works with the body. And so in comparing medications versus uh, alpha stim, that non-pharmaceutical approach we feel is, is a very good approach that a lot of our patients like. Uh, the results are also very good and outstanding. For example, 
if someone is anxious and we place them on the alpha stim, that may help their, their anxiety, but also help with other things like pain if they have headaches, uh, stress management, sleep, whereas sometimes with medications we're targeting one issue, let's say anxiety, and maybe something else may be worsened. Uh, and so for those reasons we like alpha stim as a neuromodulation intervention to help uh, balance things out as far as brain activity. I've used alpha stim myself because I must say after recommending tools and devices that, that work and seem to help, I say, well, why not use it myself? Uh, so I have uh, used alpha stim and have found it to, to really work uh, in terms of calming my brain and allowing me to, to think better. As a conventionally trained physician, I feel that although my training was very good and I'm very thankful for the training, I sometimes felt myself confronted with very difficult cases that seem refractory or intractable. By those terms, I mean that it seems as if the medications and the interventions we're using were, were not always working like we would like them to. So I always felt that it would be nice to have some additional tools. Uh, and when I started integrating other things, including nutrition, neuromodulation, which includes alpha stim, asking about sleep and stress management, what we found, what I have found in my practice is patients that had hard to treat conditions, now all of a sudden they're able to improve, get better, and they get better in a safer way without creating a new problem. So the integrative approach has been very uh, wonderful in our practice, and I think patients acknowledge it because they realize that that integrative approach is what they need to find true healing. Going through my life and being put on so many different medications, what I found is that some of them would help me lift the depression, but cause me to be more anxious. Other medications would lower the anxiety, but cause me to feel more depressed. And at one point, I can honestly say I was taking probably five different medications. I didn't even feel like myself anymore because they were trying to rebalance this stress reaction that had gotten hardwired into my nervous system. I'm talking about stress. That's right. Many of us, believe it or not, are actually addicted to stress, and it can be causing some serious health problems. Here to help us find better solutions is Heidi Hanna. So I actually grew up with an anxiety disorder that I didn't understand, and it caused me to start fainting. And so I uh, went to a lot of different doctors to figure out why I was losing consciousness. And also having stomach aches and headaches and some other symptoms, I have really struggled throughout my life with feeling hijacked by things like anxiety, depression, and ultimately they couldn't find anything wrong and so they told me that it was probably just stress. I wasn't really given any good solutions for what to do about it. So I started off um, studying psychology because I was told it was all in my head after all, so I wanted to figure that out and got a master's degree in, in um, mental health counseling, started a private practice. And I realized very quickly that most of the people who were coming into my practice were also struggling with things like nutrition and physical fitness and just the whole system was off balance. So I continued my education and I have to admit all the while really struggling myself. So I was out teaching these things globally, traveling around the world. Um, I was doing the two things I fear the most, public speaking and flying, and all the while my system was really burning out and breaking down. So I feel like it was this tipping point of finally really understanding what stress can do to our nervous system as well as to our brain. So I decided to start writing books because that's not stressful at all. <laughs> I started writing books and sharing this information and speaking about it. And I can say that at this point, um, also really fully committed to practicing what I preach. And it's why I've started to train other professionals in the stress mastery paradigm, which I think is really important, which is not to try to manage stress, not to push it down or push it away, but actually lean into it and learn from it and then let it go in the service of positive change. And so now I try to do that. I stay curious. I look at what stress is trying to teach me and how I can benefit from it. And then I, I try to share that with other people, which also holds, holds me accountable to make sure I'm actually walking the talk at the same time. I think that AlphaStim has been a game changer for me. I know my husband would say that it has. 
Um, we can both tell days when I use it and days when I don't. It helps me be the best version of myself. So if I'm feeling more anxious, it brings that down. If I'm feeling more depressed, it lifts that up. It's almost like it's doing it all simultaneously depending on what my brain needs in the moment. I have it with me all the time. So there's a lot of other interventions out there, different modalities, but I can't take them on the road with me. I can't, you know, do certain types of neurofeedback before I go on stage or, you know, while I'm getting a massage or using aromatherapy. The beautiful thing about Alpha Stim is you can use it really in an integrative way with other types of calming sensory information, which helps me feel like I'm getting into the most beautiful meditative state wherever I am. I graduated from veterinary college in 1980 and have been a practicing traditional veterinarian. And then I turned 40, had a son, and I started looking at life differently. And I also realized about that same point in time that what I was doing in practice the surgeries and the medication, I wasn't always getting to the root of the problem. It's like I could put the fire out, but I wasn't really solving the issue. So I started looking at acupuncture and chiropractic, other fields that I could get into. Um, I latched on to chiropractic and, and within that started also looking at physiotherapy. So the physical therapy modalities that could be done with animals. And I was really wanting to help in the area of pain management. So at that point in time, so we're looking at the late 90s in veterinary medicine, we had for pain phenobutazone, which is a really old chemical that had been used for horses and dogs. And then we had prednisone, so you're looking at the steroids, and recently Remedil had come on the market. But those were really the only three items we had for pain. So I'm looking at other ways through physiotherapy. So I started going to human physical therapy conferences, trying to figure out what do they have for pain that I could figure out and apply for animals. And then that's when I met up with uh, Electromedical Products International, the parent company of Alpha Stem Technology. So this is a real concern for the pet owners is that they don't want their animals to be in pain. And again, in my traditional practice, I would oftentimes see where people would say, well, we should just put them out of their misery because we don't want them in pain. And oftentimes, while they might be in pain today, there's a lot of things now we can do to alleviate that pain. So Alpha Stim is a big component of, of our everyday practice. And I have every tool and toy that's available in physio medicine, uh, the laser, the, the pulse signal therapy, the underwater treadmill, ultrasound, e-stim, qigong, I have all of them. But if I was told I could only have one thing to save the most lives, it would definitely be the Alpha Stim device. Because I've seen so many miracles, and they continue to happen, over my timeline, uh, 19 years now, but earlier on, I mean, I had thousands of animals of all species. So you got the typical dogs, cats, horses, but I've done it with cows, alpacas, llamas, goats, hamsters, rats, guinea pigs, um, all kinds of species. So if we're looking at pain, uh, a big category of what would be used in a traditional practice would be NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So the list of those that people would be familiar with would be Remedil, Carprofen, um, there's um, Medicam, Meloxicam, um, Deramax, Etagesic, there's a lot of NSAIDs. That would be one category. And so the problem with those can be that, that they do have a potential to either cause an ulceration of the stomach the liver has to work through the chemical, so we have to get through the half-life. So they can set off alterations of liver function, elevation in ALT, alkaline phosphatase, liver enzymes can change. So dogs that are on those long-term have to periodically have blood work. Uh, oftentimes they can also affect kidneys. Uh, there's the other category of used for pain and inflammation, which would be the steroids like prednisone or injectable dexamethasone. That's going to even have a greater effect on the overall body. Prolonged use of those really weakens muscle tissue, so also affects the, the, the liver. 
So, so you see those considerations, and especially as the body gets older, when it's been exposed to drugs over a longer period of time, the older animals, they can't tolerate those at all. So we don't have that consideration when we're using the alpha stem for pain. We don't have to worry about, is this gonna be harmful for the liver or the kidney? In fact, physiologically, it supports the parasympathetic system. Instantly, when, when you set this to run, it does change physiology. Now it's changing cellular physiology for the better. So that is where the body can actually digest, where the stomach is signaling the liver, signaling the gallbladder, the liver signals the pancreas that the food's coming through. The digestion can actually happen when the parasympathetic system is supported. And that's also a part of taking off that sympathetic, the fright or flight. So you're normalizing the whole endocrine system. And when you can do that, the body can begin to thrive. So the time from starting the first treatment to the response can be within the first 20 minutes of doing the treatment. Uh, oftentimes we'll treat an area of the body where they're hurting and then they get down and they can do a total body shake. You know, they're, they're, they're feeling better already. Even changes in like looking if we're doing the cranial electrotherapy stem, the changes in the position of their ears, their breathing from being short shallow to like, you know, like taking that deep breath, they're feeling better. The pupils can change from being like the big pupil, which is the fright or flight, to a calmness, the shape of the eyes. Uh, actually licking, you know, they start to lick and swallow. Uh, again, that's taken that adrenal response down. It's taken the fright or, or flight out of there. And then sometimes they'll start looking for a place they want to lay down. So it can happen instantly. It, one treatment then after that could last anywhere from eight hours to two weeks, depending on the situation. If it's one that's a mental stress, if they continually be re-exposed to that stress, then obviously, the treatment time isn't gonna last as long if they get stimulated again. But over time, because it is cumulative and long lasting, and that's what the key point is, is that this proprietary waveform is cumulative and long lasting because it actually changes the wave patterns. It changes the beta, the theta, the gamma, the delta. You know, we see more the alpha pattern more of the time. The body comes to a point where it's able to better monitor the endocrine system. So the adrenals, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the pineal, the thyroid, the digestion, it all starts to work in harmony. And, and you do see the, the, the changes you can observe, those changes that are happening physiologically because of the transition of the behavior, the body posture, what they're doing, all of that. And you're not going to get the placebo effect in an animal. It either is or it isn't. In 2005, the journal Equine Veterinary Science actually published this case study that I submitted to them based on utilizing microcurrent electrical therapy to help with wound healing. The thing about this is that electricity takes the path of least resistance. Electricity is very lazy. This is the, the, the rump of the horse and the horse had fallen on a T-post and had shattered the greater trochanter, which is the bone that comes off the opposite side of the hip. And she had had surgery. She's only four years old. She'd had surgery a month ago. So we still have the wound, the initial wound, which was 18 inches from one end to the other, eight inches across the open area. It's still infected. They've been using antibiotics and flushing it. Here's a Penrose drain, which they were using to try to help draw out to this area, but she's not healing. The electricity is just going around this. It's taken the path of least resistance. It's going around the mountain. It can't get through it. And so this is the first day that we put the alpha stem on there. We're using the AS trodes, the electrodes, to introduce this waveform uh, to to this horse's body. And so it goes from this infected wound, 10 days of therapy, to this next picture. I think that's pretty phenomenal to go from this non-healing, a month post-surgery, and, and the surgeons at that point pretty much had said, this horse isn't gonna heal. She's not ever gonna be any better than what she is now. You're gonna have to put her down. And that's when the people reached out. They were from Texas, and they knew somebody that worked with EPI, and they said, can your device do anything for this horse? So 10 days later, now we have this nice, healthy pink tissue. 
Um, this yellow in here is just for fly, that was some fly uh, spray to keep the flies off of it. But that's a humongous amount of healing time. So it was able to introduce then that electrical potential, that wavelengths and forms that you might want to induce those early embryonic cells to like heal again. We all know that the healing comes from below and the cells keep moving across, but it won't happen if you don't have the right electrical potentials going through the tissue. And then down here in the bottom left is 10 days later. So in less than three weeks, it went from not healing at all to pretty healthy pink to totally resolved. That horse then went on to heal and uh, she was a barrel racer. Um, the next few years she was performing all over the US and Canada. This could be anything anywhere. We can just see it because it's on the skin surface. But this is about getting chronic disease is going to persist because the right electrical potentials are not moving to the tissue. Anything chronic can be changed when you can get healing to it and then along with that brings the nutrients. There are no doubt physical attributes that we can see, feel, touch, uh, but there are energy mechanisms at work. Uh, and in fact, if we look at even things like the MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, that uses a concept of energy that then allow us to see things in the material, physical world. So my belief is that not everything is, is, is tangible. Uh, there, there are certain things that are relegated to to the, the energy field. Now I must admit that traditional medicine has a little ways to go in terms of understanding that aspect of it, but I believe that there's a, 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 an important link of the energy, energy fields as it pertains to structural, physical, tangible, corporeal uh, mechanisms. There's a great deal of work gone on frequencies of energy uh, that affect the physiology. And this is what makes me interested with alpha stem because of the patented waveform that they have and it's set up in such a way that the waveform will create a number of harmonics and so these harmonics create literally millions of frequencies now they're very very tiny and very weak frequencies but the body is set up with nonlinear dynamics there's millions of receptors on each cell and each cell is going to absorb what it needs and so a very infinitesimal amount of specific energy or signal can have a very large effect. And that's what happens with the human body. It's basically quantum sensitive. Um, there's research showing that one photon of light can affect the retina, one photon. And what happens is when you got that degree of sensitivity, you don't need to have a very strong signal, but you need a very, a very specific signal. And so what alpha stem does is it creates a whole series of very specific signals. They're somewhat weak, but what happens is because they're so specific, they can influence very, various uh, biochemical and physiological reactions at a cellular level. And so unless you're willing to be expansive and understand that a human being is much more complex than a label, you really can't solve their problems. And I used to solve the, pa the patients that came to me were the people that had already seen three or four or five other doctors. They, they were like, because they were just doing the same old thing. Yo, you have this condition here, we'll give you this medication. And um, I used to get in trouble with other doctors. One of them completely was disenchanted with my approach and basically told me I didn't know how to practice medicine, which was because I thought science had a place in medicine. And because I was always going to a conference, reading books and uh, reading journals and that if I only knew how to practice, which was to talk to the patient, figure out what the problem was, what category, and figure out what drug was approved by their insurance company, and that's how you practice medicine. So I thanked her very much for her knowledge and wisdom and, and basically walked around later and went, what a moron. Medicine is a very slow moving process because what happens is people get programmed or indoctrinated into one way of doing things. And basically, um, chemical medicine, pharmaceutical medicine, is basically the ta has taken over medicine. So everybody uh, studies chemistry, everybody studies pharmacology. Uh, if you go into something like psychiatry, that's pretty much what you use now, unless you're doing electroshock therapy. And uh, what occurs 
is that people think this is the sort of way you do it. All the research is funded by the pharmaceutical, most of the research is funded by pharmaceutical companies to test pharmaceutical drugs. And so when a doctor is sitting there trying to figure out what to do about a problem, he's going to look at the research literature, and the research literature says this is the way you do it. And so when you're coming in with a new technology, this is what's called a disruptive technology. You're, you're using a technology that's completely different in modality. Uh, it has its own baggage from um, past, uh, uh, past historical um, myths that have arisen. If you go back over 100 years ago, every doctor's office in the United States had an electrical therapy unit, pretty much. But then it became uh, known as quackery because they couldn't explain why it worked. So if there was no explanation why it worked, it obviously was fake. Well, it took until the 60s and 70s, really, where you got into was starting to understand the electrical processes of the nervous system and how these electrical stimulator units could affect the nervous system. And it took a while for this data to be collected and, and to it diffuse into the, the medical society. And so even now, when there's quite a bit of data collected with, with many hundreds of papers, people aren't experienced with it. It's taken a long time because there was just not an awareness of how these mechanisms work. Doctors aren't taught physics. This is all biophysics. It, it has to do with the electrical properties of the human body. And if you're not trained on what the electrical properties of the human body are, you don't have any foundation to put this information to use. I think we have been in the past, unfortunately, in, in a pharmaceutical, big pharma paradigm. And then I think with integrative and functional medicine, there's been a shift in a recognition that dietary supplementation, nutritional uh, uh, support, lifestyle matters. I think the next paradigm shift will be electromedicine because we'll realize that building upon good nutrition, good diet, getting the body electric and the electrical system working properly and, and, and targeting that very directly will allow a lot of patients that right now are suffering are told there's no hope, there's no help. Now there will be a whole new vista of approaches, safe, painless, uh, effective, that will then allow them to work. So I do believe that neuromodulation will be an electromedicine will be the wave of the future and it's already becoming that. Medicine is very enamored with its namesake, medicines. Uh, so, so medical doctors like to use medicines and people expect them to use medicines. But why not use the safest and most effective thing first